Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, my lords. Uh, just before we adjourned yesterday, we were looking at Quintel, uh, which is Supplemental Bundle 1, Tab 4. We were on page 36, which shows figure one. And that is what Quintel calls its first object. If I could take you back then, please, to the text towards the bottom of page 31. This is still its first object, and it says this. We are thus ensured that the electrical current will pass into the plug and thereafter into the operating device if and only if the plug is properly inserted into the socket. That is to say that the power supply of the socket only occurs when a satisfactory mechanical connect contact is established between the two connectors. This mounting also presents a significant benefit that when no connector is set up in the front plate of the socket, the outlets of the socket do not conduct any electrical current. That is to say, young children, for example, can insert any foreign bodies, possibly conductive, into the socket without any danger whatsoever, and they can even remove the socket without danger. Um, that, of course, is because there's no power anywhere near the socket as a result of the remoteness feature. Are you relying on the use of the word properly? Uh, so I say in context, properly inserted here means fully inserted. Sorry, can you just remind me why you say properly means fully? Well, firstly, we, we, we looked at the passage uh, on page 30, yes. which equates properly inserted with maximum contact surface, and I referred you to the evidence of Mr. Borowski that maximum contact surface meant fully inserted. That's the first part of the answer to my Lord's question. Yes. The second part is going to come by reference to the, the second object of Quintel, right. which we're moving to now, which is a safe waterproof arrangement. And one can see that most easily in figure two, which is on page 37. Plainly, uh, that is a fully inserted plug in figure two. Um, but you will also note that there is a, a sort of bulge around the middle of the combined plug and socket, which is a circumferential rubber seal. And that's only going to work when the two are completely mated. There's also a magnet one and a, uh, a magnetic switch two, which you see in very close proximity. Now, in, in the case of figure two, the supply device is so remote that it doesn't actually make it onto the page. And the corresponding description is towards the top of page 34. And again, we say this makes the position uh, wholly clear. When, a, when plug A is inserted into socket B, nothing happens during the insertion, which eliminates any sparks due to extra current failures. On the contrary, at the end of the process, magnet one comes close to switch two, and so on. And it is at the end of the process of insertion that current flows. At the end of that process, the magnet comes close to the switch, it attracts the moving part of it so that the switch is closed 
uh, and the socket will then go live. Uh, and once again, uh, this passage was accepted by Mr. Borowski to uh, show Quintel's intention was that power should only be switched on when the plug is fully inserted. And the references are, are in our written skeleton. Uh, see also line, <clears throat> line 22, the reference to final contact being established. And line 36, the electrical contact is only established when the mechanical contact is optimal. And again, that was subject to evidence. It corresponds with full insertion. And then having, having been through the whole document with Mr. Borowski, I put it to him that taking the disclosure as a whole, it provided a clear teaching of the desirability of ensuring that the plug was fully inserted before the power was turned on, and he agreed. That's day five, line 577, supplemental bundle two, tab 23, page 592. Sorry, because that, that reference again, it was, it was Supplementary Bundle 2. Tab 23. Yes. Page 592. Um, so that's Quintel, my lords. And next I wanted to show you the decision of the Bundesgerichthof in proceedings between the respondent and a sister company of the first appellant in relation to the German... Uh, version of the patent in suit. That's in Supplemental Bundle 3, behind tab 26. Um, there are two matters. Sorry, you, 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 you just said it was a decision of the Bundesgerichtshof, but it's the decision of the Federal Patent Service. Oh, it's, oh, it is. You're right. I've mistranslated. It's the Federal Patent Service. It's a bit different. That's the first, it's the yeah. first instance decision. It, it, it is indeed. Um, there are two matters that we say may assist the court. Uh, first, the assessment of the disclosure of Quintel itself, and second, the manner in which the court interpreted the claim in issue in light of Quintel. Now, the case was heard by a panel of five judges. You can see this on page, top of page 761, including two graduate engineers and a doctor of engineering. And if you could turn forward, please, to page 763, you'll see a list of the exhibits to the judgment, um, in respect of which uh, you may wish to mark that Nick 6 is Neunschwander, that Nick 8 is Salati, and Nick 14, Quintel. Now, the court begins with a review of the patent on page 768. And then, on the middle of the following page, it records that the preamble to Claim 1 is based on Quintel. And it says that uh, Quintel describes a voltage supply apparatus comprising a receptacle and a power supply device arranged at a distance from the receptacle. So uh, already inconsistent with my learned friend's uh, construction, which allows for neighboring components. And then on page 770, the court splits the claim in issue into integers. And the integers that we are concerned with are M3.1, primarily, and a bit of M3.2, that's inserted. Uh, note also M4.1 is the, the translation of the remote integer, and it's translated as the power supply device is set up at a distance from the receptacle. <clears throat> M moving forward then to page 771, the court addresses the 
in the issues of construction, uh, uh, what it calls interpretation, and begins by reviewing the disclosure of Quintel. It, it, the judgment says, 3.1, the patent in suit strives for a greater safety against faulty switching. Uh, the problem is taken into account in the interpretation because the Senate is convinced that this is the key for a correct understanding of patent claim one. To understand the contribution of the patent in suit to increased safety, it's essential first to analyze, to first analyze the safety level, which is improved by the patent in suit. Now, pausing there, what they're saying is, the patent says itself that this is an improvement on Quintel, so we're going to start with seeing what Quintel tells us about safety. Then they say that NIC 14, that's Quintel, discloses two techno technical features which are relevant. A, a power supply set up at a distance from the receptacle. The receptacle is the socket, so that is the remoteness feature. And B, a plug detector, which detects the presence of a plug inserted into the receptacle. Now, at this point, they haven't concluded, uh, drawn any conclusions about the, uh, the technical of the nature of insertion uh, which is necessary uh, and that's what they, they come on to do. So at the top of 772 you'll see the two figures from Quintel and then uh, remoteness is discussed in the next paragraph. We're told the physical separation of receptacle B and the power supply device in the housing 4 as illustrated in figure 1 produces protection against release of the open or unused receptacle B. And then uh, a little further on, the last sentence of this paragraph, the housing four of the power supply device in which there is always a live power supply voltage S is set up at a remote location from the receptacle B, i.e. naturally at a location where, to stay with the same example, water cannot enter under any circumstances. And then in the next paragraph, we come on to insertion. Second sentence, regardless of whether the power supply voltage is switched to the receptacle, as in the exemplary embodiment figure one, or the exemplary embodiment figure two, it is switched only when the plug has been properly inserted into the receptacle. And last sentence, the switch two is open in the standby state and connects only when magnet one and switch two are opposite and sufficiently close to one another at the end of the plug-in operation. Only when the plug housing has been properly pressed in the sense of being correctly or completely inserted is the switch to closed due to the magnetic field. Against this background and taking into account the, the technically requiring triggering threshold of the switch to, the contact pins 14 are inserted almost completely into the holes of the receptacle and therefore cannot be touched when there is live power supply voltage in S. And then the paragraph towards the bottom of that page, has, we have the court explaining that this level of safety is then upgraded in claim one of the patent in suit by using switches which detect the presence of the contact pins of the plug. So whereas Quintel uses a single magnetic detector, claim one uses two pin detectors. And the court observes in the, the second sentence that this occurs without any change in the safety level with regard to activation protection and shock protection as described in Quintel. In other words, it's taking the two Quintel features, remoteness and full insertion, the two, two safety features of Quintel, and building upon them and improving upon them only in relation to the switching arrangement, which is now going to be moved to the pinholes. And if we pause for a moment and consider my learned friend's construction in that context, so the German court's saying, we, we, you start with Quintel, you build upon it. My learned friend's construction it, it is uh, less stringent 
and less safe than Quintel in two ways. It is less remote and it requires less insertion. So remarkably, it involves resiling from the advantages that are acknowledged in Quintel, which is part of the disclosure of the patent. Um, my Lords, then the conclusion of the German court is in the second paragraph on page 774. With this understanding, detection of an inserted plug according to integer 3.1 presupposes that a plug with its contact pins is inserted almost completely. And then uh, another sentence down, as a result, any detection that occurs at the start of the process of insertion <coughs> is excluded from the claim. In other words, prior art, which doesn't require full insertion, is not uh, within the claim. I don't see that. Sorry, so, so by the, oh, I was going to say the first hole punch, but that's not going to assist my lord. So in the same paragraph, mm -hmm. uh, the, the sentence beginning consequently. So we have, we have the conclusion about inserted almost completely. Consequently, such detection of the plug according to the pattern in suit, which detects the plug or contact pins already at the start of the process of insertion, will be excluded. Yeah. So that, that's the uh, conclusion. And then in the following page, the court is addressing directly the argument that the degree of insertion is not the subject of claim one. So that's the plaintiff who's, who's uh, claiming re revocation, the plaintiff's opinion. So 3.2, with the above interpretation, the Senate explicitly does not share plaintiff's opinion that the patent in suit leaves open how deeply the contact pins are to be inserted. And then picking it up another sentence down, Although the patent in suit does not cite either an exact measure for the insertion depth required for detection or an accurate activation time, uh, nor is this necessary because it would be clearly apparent to the skilled person that adequate shock protection would necessitate detection of a plug that has been inserted almost completely as explained above. Now, my, my learned friend relied on a passage uh, towards the, the top of the following page it, in support, I think, of the proposition that the, the German court was taking a different approach to construction. And he got very close to saying that the, the law in Germany was different on, uh, in relation to construction. I think he was somewhat challenged in respect of that proposition by my Lord Justice Burse. But I think what's actually happening at the top of 776 is there is an acknowledgement that the, uh, the, the patent was amended in prosecution uh, in relation to Quintel. So you start at the bottom of 775. In the European examination proceedings, the device Quintel was found to be the most proximate prior art and accordingly, the object, according to the invention of the patent suit, has been made more specific. So it's nothing to do with uh, construction. Now, the full insertion point then comes back into the judgment in the context of the Neunschwander prior art. Uh, we see this on page 23, page 782 of the bundle. It may help, actually, just to have, because it gives a bit of context for the debate, the Neunschwander prior art um, as well. It, it's actually on the very previous page of the bundle. I don't know if you've got double-sided pages or, or, or not. But it, it is there on the previous page. And, and what you see, if you look at Neunschwander, if you look at figure 1b, um, there's a hole marked 26, and that is a hole that is provided 
for it's described as being a hole to receive the, the tips of the plug pins. So the plug is meant to go all the way through into that hole. So um, it, this isn't anything remotely near to full insertion. The, the power is going to be supplied pretty much when the plug is half inserted. And it's in that context that the German court said what it did on the paragraph in the middle of page 782. For an unprejudiced person skilled in the art, detection of the contact pins is already derived from this disclosure, that's Neunschwander, at the start of the process of insertion of the plug into the safety receptacle, and at any rate, before the actual contact of the pins with the contact ends. This necessarily leads to the result that, after successful detection, the power supply voltage is switched at the start of the plug insertion operation. Thus, the safety receptacle, according to Neunschwander, differs from the patent, which requires detection of an almost completely inserted plug, as explained in the, the introduction, that, that is to say, the pre-characterising portion of the claim. My Lords, in their appeal on construction, the appellants are inviting you to reach a different conclusion uh, from the German court on both these issues of construction. And it's common ground that this decision is entitled to respect from, from this court. Uh, there are two bases upon which uh, they say it should bear no weight. Um, first, they say it was based on different evidence. And second, they point out that the German court relied on Quintel. As to evidence, um, the question isn't whether the evidence was different, but whether it was materially different. Um, as to that, it doesn't appear that the, the, the German Senate needed any evidence to reach their conclusions. They simply read the patent and they read Quintel. Uh, whereas for our case, there was uh, plenty of evidence before the trial judge relating to the teaching of Quintel, both from Mr. Borowski and from Professor Wheeler. And in light of that evidence, the judge held that Quintel's device required full insertion and indeed that it had its supply device kept away from its socket. That's paragraph 54 of the judgment. There was no evidence whatsoever um, going the other way. So in fact, the different evidence point uh, helps me and not my learned friend. Um, my learned friend also mentioned the identity of the skilled person. Um, the skilled person in Germany and the UK in the German and UK cases did differ, but only in relation, only a tiny bit, in relation to their aviation expertise. And even then, the German Senate said that there would be an av aviation expert available to be consulted, so, so part of the team, if you will. But there were no matters of aviation expertise or aviation common general knowledge that bore on these issues of interpretation. So uh, that is a distinction without any corresponding relevant difference. As to the reliance on Quintel, uh, my learned friend says the judge was right as a matter of UK law to ignore it. Um, we suggest that rather overlooks the detail of what the judge said. Uh, if we turn to the judgment, key passages on this issue of paragraphs 79 and 89. Uh, and what actually happened was the judge found the construction arguments uh, to weigh so clearly in our favour that reference to Quintel was unnecessary. That was the context in which he said he didn't need to refer to Quintel. And we see that also, I'm not going to ask you to turn to them, but just, just for your, your note in paragraphs 46 and 76. He didn't say it would have been wrong to refer to Quintel if the position had been more equivocal. And, and that is the approach we commend to this court. We say the answers are tolerably clear from the patent on its own. 
if there is any doubt, Quintel and indeed the decision of the German court provide a compelling basis for dismissing uh, the appeal on construction. My Lords, could we now go back to the patent and pick out the other passages that bear on the insertion issue in particular? And that starts in paragraph 9. Supply voltage is only available at the socket if a plug is plugged into the socket, i.e. there's no supply voltage to the two-pole socket for as long as there is no plug of an electrical device plugged in. Once again, we say the natural meaning of plugged in, past participle, is, is fully inserted. Um, one doesn't describe a plug as plugged in if it's hanging half out of the socket. And that phrase is repeated in paragraphs 12 and 13. And paragraph 14 then refers to switches being activated by the inserted contact pins of the plug. Again, the past participle. Uh, then if you skip forward to paragraph 23, uh, this tells us that figure 2 shows a computer with a power cable with a plug, plug that is plugged in to socket 22. So we've got a guide a visual guide to what the patent means when it says plugged in uh, and figure two shows a plug that is all the way uh, fully inserted. That arrangement can be seen in more detail in uh, figure three. Uh, which has the micro sw switches at the very bottom of the socket holes. And it's fairly clear from the diagram that they will only be activated when the plug is fully inserted. And indeed, that is precisely what the accompanying disclosure says in paragraphs 24 and 27. The switches are said to be at the bottom of each plug hole, and there is said to be contact with contact elements when the plug pins are inserted into the plug holes. Now, my, my learned friend took you to paragraph 15, and what he wanted to take from paragraph 15 was that there was a reference in the second sentence to, uh, well, there was use of the word plugged in uh, as, uh, as to mean not fully inserted. Um, the sentence is, only if the plug casing is close enough, i.e. brought closer than a predefined distance to the socket, is the plugged in plug casing detected. Um, we suggest uh, that my learned friend has this wrong. The, the patent is using the word plugged in there clearly to mean closer than a predefined distance. But we know from the context uh, uh, the surrounding context, and indeed the reference to the, 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 the minimum distance, that the patentee wants to keep that distance as small as possible. We also know that from Quintel. That's a safety issue. So it's being used to mean fully inserted, or as close to that as you are able to get with your apparatus. It is not telling you half inserted is good enough. That's contrary to the entire direction of travel of the teaching. We turn forward then to the claim itself. <coughs> Line 8 refers to a socket detector which detects the presence of a plug and taken together with lines 20 to 23 uh, we know that that's a plug detector which detects the presence of two contact pins. That's a requirement of this claim. Now, uh, pausing there, if, if that's all the claim said on this issue, socket detector and contact pins, it, it would be genuinely unclear what degree of plug insertion was required. 
But that's not all the claim says. It goes on to resolve the ambiguity in line 9. The detection required, it's already been mentioned, but now we're told in addition, the detection required is of a plug inserted in the socket. So th there, are, there are two points there. First, the past participle again. But second, if full insertion is not required, the phrase inserted in the socket is mere surplusage. If my learner friends were right, and all that was required was half insertion, the claim could just say a socket detector detecting the presence of the plugs, the, the pleasant present presence of a plug, together with the, the reference at the bottom of uh, testing for contact pins. The, the only construction which gives meaning to those four words is one which requires full insertion. And it is, of course, a conventional canon of construction that one should assume, assume that the wording serves a purpose. My lords, now we can turn to the judgment and consider the errors of principle that are asserted against it. The first is the judge's use of reference numerals. Now, the judge called uh, the insertion dispute the first construction issue, and he, he, he dealt with it beginning in page uh, paragraph 67. He first summarised the party's submissions at 67 and 68, and then he began to resolve the dispute in 69. And that's quite a long paragraph, and it, it bears careful consideration. At the beginning, he says, I'm going to start with the language, the wording of claim one. And he quotes the critical wording from line nine, the presence of a plug inserted in the socket. Then over the page, he observes the reference in the claims to socket detectors 45 and 46. That's where my learned friend says he started to go wrong. The charge is that he relied on those reference numerals to limit the claim scope. In other words, that he said, because figure three so shows detectors 45 and 46 in a fully inserted arrangement, that must be what the claim means. And to be clear, if that's what he had done, we accept it would have been an error. There's no dispute about the law there. If the judge had relied on the reference numerals, um, uh, but sorry, there's no, no dispute about the law. H however, if he had done that, um, and this is a not unimportant point, um, it would be a victimless crime because he reached the right conclusion anyway. Don't lose sight of the fact that uh, even if part of the reasoning was wrong, the conclusion is correct. Uh, but in any event, that's not what he did. And he tells us that's not what he's doing. So the second line at the top of... Uh, I've probably got a different copy of the judgment team. So I'm about a third of the way into to paragraph uh, 69. Accordingly, simply to understand what is referred to in claim one, it is necessary to refer to the drawings. He's telling you in terms, I'm not making that mistake. Now, as to what is allowed, my learned friend took you to uh, Lord Justice Jacob in paragraph 17 of, of the Virgin construction case, says it's legitimate to use reference numerals to figure out which way up, up to hold the map. But it's also legitimate, he said, to see where in the specific embodiment a particular claim element is. That's what the judge is doing here. He's saying, uh, in order to help understand what's going on, I'm going to look at the specific embodiment, because I know that that's consistent with the claim. But he's not doing it to limit the claim. He's doing it to understand what is being referred to. He's using the specific embodiment to shed light on the meaning of the words and not to limit them. And we can see that from the structure of the paragraph. My learned friend says he used the reference numerals as a basis for concluding 
that inserted it, inserted in the socket meant fully inserted. But he actually ends his reliance on the preferred embodiment before drawing that conclusion. The, the way this works is he, he interprets, in the middle of the paragraph, he interprets the claim together with figure three and gets as far as the penultimate line of, of uh, the the penultimate line of the paragraph. And at that point, so when he ends his re reference to the preferred embodiment, his conclusion is expressly equivocal. He says this, in this way, that is to say in the preferred embodiment, the words inserted in the socket and the plug in the socket are referring to a state of affairs where the pins of the plug are in contact with the detectors of the pins of the plug, and that requires a degree of insertion which brings the pins into contact with the plug detector. That's the conclusion he draws from figure three, that there is a degree of insertion. Well, that is common ground. It is common to both parties' constructions. So the conclusion he drew in relation to the preferred embodiment is unobjectionable. And it is then that he goes on to draw his conclusion expressly and exclusively by reference to the language. The natural meaning of the words inserted in the socket using the past participle suggests that the plug has been fully inserted. So with the preferred embodiment, I get as far as a degree of insertion. But the bit that, that actually clashes with my learned friend's case is nothing to do with the preferred embodiment. And he then goes on to test that interim conclusion against the rest of the disclosure. Now, the appellants also complain about the reference to uh, reference numerals in paragraph 71, but he's dealing with the description there, not the claim. He's entitled to uh, refer to reference numerals at that point, because he's saying, is any, does any of the body of the patent conflict with my interim conclusion. So there's no uh, merit in that complaint. This may be too close a textual analysis, but what does the judge mean by in addition? Uh, so I, I think that's a slightly um, unhappy phrase, because given what he's actually doing. But um, I think what he's saying is that I've got so far in my understanding, but now the, the addition is the wording requires full insertion. So it's in addition to the degree of insertion that I get from um, a, a wider consideration of what's going on. And he's saying that the, the, the wording of the claim then takes it further. It adds to that and requires, for, requires full um, insertion. Well, I was going to go to the second complaint, then the second alleged error of law, which relates to uh, the figure four embodiment uh, and what was said to be an erroneous limitation by reference to the absence of drawings. The, the headline problem with this part of my learned friend's appeal is that it was entirely without evidence. Um, Mr. Borowski did not even mention the arrangement that's discussed in the final sentence of paragraph 32, on which the whole argument is based. Um, so my learned friends are left trying to make bricks without straw. Uh, this part of the specification is concerned with what the, the catering for different plug geometries. Because US plugs look different to EU plugs, how do you test for both? Uh, and if one looks at figure four of the patents, Uh, that shows the flat spades of the US plug at 40 and 41, and the round pins of an EU plug at 68 and 69, and in the middle, a socket sensor, 48. We'll be coming back to that when we look at claim five. Um, if you look also at figure three, 
you see the plug holes are shown in cross-section uh, and they are still numbered 40 and 41. So that reflects the numbering of the US plug holes in figure 4. The point here is that it is the EU plug holes, 68 and 69, that are being added to the embodiment of figure 3. Now, the associated description is paragraph 32. And picking it up in column 7 at line 7, we are told that uh, the European plug holes also each have a contact element and a micro switch. So in this configuration, we are adding to the preferred embodiment of figure two, a pair, of, a pair of new holes and a pair of new switches. One switch for each of the four plug holes. And there's no difficulty with having all those switches positioned at the end of the holes in accordance uh, with the judge's interpretation of claim one. Uh, so far, so clear. But it's the final sentence that my own friends particularly rely on. Moreover, uh, the plug holes can also be arranged so that they are not at right angles to each other, but rather overlay each other, in which case the micro switches are arranged to the sides of the plug holes. Now they say that's a disclosure of an arrangement that falls outside uh, the full insertion interpretation that the judge arrived at. And they say that's a powerful basis for rejecting it because all the disclosure should be within claim one. Um, but we disagree about the disclosure. Uh, the, this argument relies on a conflict that simply cannot be established. My learned friends need to prove unequivocally that this disclosure at the end of paragraph 32 uh, would be understood by the skilled person as being of an arrangement which did not test for full insertion. That necessarily involves demonstrating that a switch to the side of a plug hole cannot be used to test for full insertion. And there's no evidence to that end. Indeed, my learned friend doesn't rely on any. There's nothing more in the patent that assists. There's no indication of the purpose of this alternate geometry. And as the judge observed, there's no drawing to help understand whether there is in fact a conflict with his full insertion. But e even without any evidence, my lords, it's easy enough to see that one could arrange a switch to the side of a plug hole which activated when the plug was fully inserted. The plugs have rounded or chamfered ends. So you could mount a switch that was to the side, um, but also tested for full insertion because it was at the side and the bottom. I mean, having to do this on the hoof as, as it was because, because the point was never raised in evidence. But there's no difficulty with it as a matter of geometry. Um, another possibility is that the micro switches arranged to the side that are being referred to here are exclusively the additional micro switches of line nine uh, 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 of line nine of column seven. That they are not the original micro switches that are introduced earlier in column five. Paragraph 24, bottom of that paragraph, at the bottom of each plug hole 4041, there are micro switches 45, 46. So the new plug holes, 68, 69, might have micro switches halfway up, in which case that part of the resulting apparatus wouldn't be within the claim. It doesn't matter because the US side of it still would be. So there's no clash. A another possibility that arises from my learned friend's submissions yesterday is that testing for full insertion is done by the casing detector. Again, no clash with claim one. Finally, on this point, we say the charge against the judge involves a mischaracterization of the judgment. The appellants say that he discounted this sentence of the patent 
because there was no associated uh, drawing. We, we, we don't think that's fair. If you look at the judgment, um, paragraph 72, he expressly acknowledged the overlaid arrangement that was described at the end of paragraph 32. And then in paragraph 73, he rehearsed the appellant's submissions as to what the arrangement in, in that sentence might disclose to the skilled person and what the consequence might be. Now, as, as I've explained, those submissions are contingent upon the switches being arranged at a point which does not test full insertion. So an understanding of where the switches were to be located would have assisted the judge in determining whether or not this arrangement was a clash with his construction. Should they be to the side at the bottom of the hole or to the side halfway down the hole? And, and as part of the judge's consideration of the point, he said, there's no drawing dealing with this possibility which shows precisely where the micro switches should be placed. That, that precisely is important. He had no evidence to help him. And what he's saying is that the specification offered no assistance either. So the, the judge's reference to the absence of a drawing is simply an acknowledgement of a lacuna in the appellant's argument. And this was one of his reasons for deciding that the passage was not sufficiently conclusive to have a bearing on his construction of the claim. And, and there's no error in that analysis. So when you said precise, where's the word precise? I've lost it. 70. Final line of 72, my lord. Oh, 72. I see. Thank you. The next charge was that the judge uh, failed to consider the purpose of the invention. Um, my learned friend said that the purpose was to create a safe power supply, and we agree. Uh, then he said that no, access, no aspect of that purpose requires that the club plug be fully inserted um, in the apertures of the socket before it can be detected. Instead, he says, the purpose is achieved irrespective of the degree of insertion. Um, my laws, that argument doesn't stand up to scrutiny. There was extensive material before the judge linking safety with full insertion. We've already looked at Quintel, which made that link expressly and emphatically, and indeed relied on it for providing a waterproof seal between plug and socket. Um, there was also evidence from Prof Professor Wheeler to the effect that full insertion protects against spillage. And you can see why that is. That a bit like in Quintel, if you have the plug casing flush against the socket, it provides something in the way of a seal. And given that what, one of the things you're very concerned about in an aircraft environment is spilled coffee causing an electric shock, that additional seal is of value. That was Professor Wheeler's evidence, paragraph 98, 198 of his first report, Supplemental Bundle 1, tab 6, and it was unchallenged. He also gave evidence that the requirement for Full insertion provided protection against shock when pulling a plug out. That's paragraph 241.1, again unchallenged. Uh, finally, we refer you to Mr. Borowski's evidence. In his paragraph 131, that the skilled person would understand that the problem being addressed by the patent is to avoid power being supplied by the socket to the socket unless the plug is properly inserted. Um, my learned friend said properly inserted doesn't mean fully inserted. Uh, we say that is uh, semantics. Uh, in this context, it plainly does. And uh, we remind you that properly inserted was the language used in Quintel for precisely that arrangement. The, the final um, complaint advanced by my learned friend relates to claim five. Now the preferred embodiment of our apparatus has three detectors. I mentioned them at the beginning of my submissions. We've looked at them already in figures three and four. It has the pair of pin detectors 
45 and 46, which the patent calls socket detectors, and it has a casing detector, 48. The pin detectors are sensing the presence of plug pins, the casing detector, the, the presence of a plug casing. So those sensing criteria are different. And the triggering distance can therefore be different too. The patentee could have said, I want my pin detectors to trigger as soon as the plug pins entered the pin holes, and my casing detector to trigger when the plug casing is touching the socket. There would be no conflict in doing, doing that. You could have a, a micro switch that was actually embedded in the, in the housing, but there's no inconsistency because the authentication tests associated with the detectors are different. And we set out the parts of the description that explain this distinction in our respondent's skeleton, paragraphs 35 to 38. I don't propose to go through them, but I, I do want to touch on the claims um, to show you the overall scheme. That scheme starts in claim one, which requires pin sensors in the uh, characterizing portion. It also requires, we say, a test for full insertion in the pre-characterizing portion. It's not entirely clear, uh, but it may be that that test could be carried out by the casing detector. The casing detector is an option in claim one. It's not obligatory. But you, it, it seems to me as a matter of logic, it seems to us, that you could tick off the various requirements of claim one by having your pin detectors and having the optional uh, casing detector and testing for full insertion with the casing detector. It's a slightly eccentric read, but as a matter of logic, it, it, it may work. Um, the mandatory addition of the casing detector comes in claim four. And then claim five sets the triggering parameter for that, a minimum distance. Now, we, we don't actually accept that that minimum distance is necessarily inconsistent with the inserted almost completely that was the conclusion of the German court. Um, that is because, uh, as I just mentioned, you could have a casing detector, you could have a casing detector which tested for full insertion. And that, after all, is the subject of Quintel. Uh, and that would also satisfy claim five, the minimum distance requirement. So we, 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 for these reasons, that, that, that there isn't a conflict, as my learned friends suggest. They, 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 they put it like this in their skeleton. This is paragraphs 34 and 35. They say claim five depends on claim one. Claim five is the narrower claim. It defines a subset of the voltage supply apparatuses claimed in claim one. Therefore, claim one included in its scope the voltage supply apparatuses of claim five, which, as the judge correctly found, do not require full plug insertion. That, that, that's entirely correct. The error comes in the next paragraph. The judge was therefore wrong to find that the scope of claim one was limited to voltage supply apparatuses requiring full insertion of the plug. His treatments of claims one and five are not consistent. That, we say, is, is logically erroneous. Claim one does not exclude the possibility of an additional detection mechanism. Indeed, it, if you look at the reference numerals, it rather indicates you could have that. And we know you can have that because of claim four. Claim four requires it in addition. It, because it's an additional type of sensor, it is necessarily narrower. And the appellant's argument fails to appreciate that because the pin detectors and the casing detectors are detecting different criteria they can have different triggering parameters without any conflict. By analogy, claim one is to a belt tightly fastened. Claim five adds to that a pair of braces loosely fastened. And the appellant's case is that as a matter of logic, you can't wear loose base braces with a tight belt. Mr. Cunningham, can I just, can I put something to you which it's not about belts and braces, it's about pins and casings, just to make sure that I've understood what you're saying. Is, the point, is this an illustration of the point you're making, that the 
pin detectors, for example, could detect two knitting needles fully inserted. So there wouldn't be a casing. If you have the casing detector and the pin detectors, both, and if you took, put two knitting needles in the socket, the pin detectors would say OK, but the casing detector wouldn't say OK. And that would still work to save you from knitting needles, even if the casing detector wasn't concerned about how deeply plugged in the plug was, because it, it only has to detect that there's a casing nearby. It doesn't have to detect that, that the casing is fully inserted. The pins can detect that the pins are fully inserted. And so that's meant to be an example which is closer to what we're talking about. Yeah, so is that, does that fit with what you're saying? Precisely so. Uh, that, that is actually, an, your, my Lord's example shows you the utility in the subsidiary claims. There is value, and, and indeed it is precisely because you're sensing a different criteria that you get particular value out of it. You're not just duplicating the pin sensors. Um, my lords, for all these reasons we say the judge was right to agree with the German court that claim one requires full insertion, and I was proposing to move on to the second construction issue remotely from the socket. Um, the appellants say that a device, supply device being provided remotely from the socket um, uh, can be one that is uh, merely separated, that is situated right next door to it. Um, and they say that that is something that's suggested by the Neunschwander prior art, um, and that, that, that's the context for this, this argument. The judge disagreed. He said that's not what the word remote means. <laughs> and of course it's right. It isn't. You don't have a remote control that is... Uh, attached to the side of your television. Um, he said that the, pat the patent is concerned with keeping high voltages away from passengers. Uh, and I've already showed you um, uh, the, the German decision to the effect that the claim was based on Quintel, and Quintel had a socket and supply device at a distance from each other. Uh, that is not materially different to the judge's construction. Uh, could you take, please, um, the patent and my learner friend's appeal skeleton. And you want paragraph 38 in the skeleton, and we can start in paragraph 2 of the patent. Paragraph 2 explains at line 12 that in an aeroplane cabin, uh, power sockets are located in the area of the passenger seat. That may seem obvious, but one of the criticisms the appellants make is that the judge failed to distinguish between remote from the socket and remote from the passenger. Um, and we say that there is no real distinction because the purpose of having mains power remote from the socket is because mains power will then be remote from the passenger. As we observed in our skeleton, the patentee is not concerned about the well-being of the socket. Moving forward then to paragraph 6, we're told that the invention is concerned with safe voltage on a plane. In paragraph 7, the task is solved by claim 1. Paragraph 8 says, in terms, the supply device is located away from the socket. It doesn't say located next to the socket. Now, at this point, we can look across to my learned friend's skeleton. And you'll see in paragraphs, paragraph 41, they, they review these passages, paragraphs 6 to 10. Um, they acknowledge their significance in relation to this issue. They look at paragraph 6, they mention paragraph 8, they don't mention what it says, located, uh, located away from the socket. It is accepted, however, that paragraph 8 
includes an account of the pre-characterizing features of the claim. You see that in their paragraph 43. So common ground that an account of the remoteness feature is a supply device that is located away from the socket. Not a promising starting point, they suggest. Um, paragraph 9 of the patent then says that this means that the socket itself is safe when not in use. And then we come to the main dispute regarding the description, which relates to paragraph 10. As to that, could you please look at my learned friend's skeleton, paragraph 45. They say that paragraph 10 addresses a different aspect of the invention to the previous paragraphs. They say, if the supply device were located within the socket, the socket would be a potential source of danger. Pausing there, we agree. The supply device is always live, and therefore a potential source of danger to be kept away from passengers if possible. Um, they then quote the first line of paragraph 10, which states in terms that the supply device should be separate and remote from the socket. And they assert that the skilled person would understand this to mean merely separate. The basis for ignoring the express distinction that the patent appears to draw between separation and remoteness is said to be the, the cross-examination of Professor Wheeler. He is said to have confirmed that remoteness as per the patent means physical separation and nothing more. Well, can we turn up the transcript to see whether that is really the case? This is Supplemental Bundle 2, um, tab 21. And you on page 446 of the bundle. Page 255, which is bottom left of the four pages. And the question is put at line five. In other words, Professor, what the patentee would be understood to be concerned with here is physically separating the supply device and the socket. To which he says, the patentee is suggesting that removing the high voltage from the socket area when there is no plug in there and keeping those voltages in a remote location away from the confines of the very close environment of the seat makes matters safer. Um, this is dead contrary to the proposition for which it's been cited. And then the question is put again. I say to you physically separating the supply device from the socket, that's what he's talking about here. Well, that gives you the option of then locating and designing the supply device in a different location, yes. I mean, we don't accept that this is a matter for expert evidence. There are no terms of art in this sentence. But um, for what it's worth, the evidence has been completely mischaracterized by my learned friends. Now, the, the last proposition in their skeleton on this point is paragraphs 47 to 49. This is their main point, I think. They say, the only source of danger that the patent's remoteness is concerned with is the cables to the socket. They say, paragraph 10 goes on to explain in a passage that does not appear anywhere in the judgment that the source of danger in question is not supply device, but the cables. Um, we say that argument is plainly wrong. Paragraph nine of the patent is addressed to keeping the socket safe when not in use. Paragraph 10 starts by discussing remote location of the supply device, which may be carrying mains voltage. That's not an idle observation, because the whole purpose of the document is to teach you how to keep mains voltage away from passengers. It's expressly identifying the supply device as a potential source of danger. Sorry, where was that? My Lord, that is paragraph 10, the very first line. Due to separate and remote location of supply device and socket, the supply device, which may be carrying mains voltage, is kept away. 
just to be clear, their submission is this is not concerned with the danger, any danger caused by the supply device. Now, the, the appellants are of course right that the cables are a source of danger. The argument that they're the only source of danger is hopelessly inconsistent and, and hopelessly wrong. Um, and, and even if one focuses on the cables alone, uh, one can see that. The, the, the appellants say that this claim includes an arrangement where the supply device and socket are next to each other. Um, and what we say is that, well, that, that's just kicking the can down the road. That's reintroducing the very problem um, that the patent is engaged with addressing. I think the easiest way for me to explain that is by reference to figure one of the patent. So if you have figure one open before you, it has the socket 22 in the arm of the seat. Now the conventional domestic um, the solution would involve power cables that were always live attaching to that socket. And in this context, that would be a source of danger. Um, so claim one, as construed by the judge, adds a supply device to control the power to the socket, and you see that at 16. Because you've got a supply device, there are now two relevant cables. You've got the cable 20 that is going from supply device to the uh, socket, which my learner friends say that's all remoteness is about. That cable is what they're worried about. And then you've got the cables 28 and 29 that are always live that are going to the supply device. Now, consider the supply device is relocated to the box 32 that you see right next to 22. Well, only friend that says that satisfies the remoteness requirements. And it says, the reason it satisfies it is that the tiny little inch long cables that would go then between 22 and 32 will be safe when not in use. But at the same time, you've got to get power permanently to your new supply device 32. And that's going to run along the route of cable 20. So they've made one cable safe, but only at the expense of, at the expense of introducing uh, a, a cable with it, it, precisely the same level of danger. It's always live, it's always going into the arm of the seat, and for that reason we say it makes no sense at all. My well, Lords, we can move on then to the criticisms of the judge's remoteness construction. And uh, there are three. We can take them quite quickly. The first is that the judge didn't consider the purposive meaning of the claim. Um, that's simply not correct. And we've given you the references in paragraph 53 of our skeleton. Um, see in particular paragraphs 85 and 88 of the judgment which rely on the safety objective. Um, then uh, my learner friends criticise um, the judge's concern about the position of the supply device. They say there was no evidence anyone was concerned about the location of such things. Uh, that's not quite right. If you take the supplemental bundle one, Turn to tab eight. This is my friend's expert, Mr. Borowski. Page 164 of the bundle, paragraph 177 of the report. So the context for this is Neunschwander, and he's, he's saying, well, if I'm wrong about Neunschwander and remoteness, it, it would be obvious to introduce it. Uh, and he says this, if I'm wrong about that, 
it would have been obvious to the skilled person to position the socket in the arm of the seat and have the components which control the supplied voltage elsewhere, for example, under the seat, as was done in the MPOW system. The motivation for doing so would be to provide a safer system by protecting the supply device from damage as well as protecting passengers from the risk of electric shocks. So, obvious to move the supply device out of harm's way for safety reasons. And he says that motivation is independent of the disclosure of Neunschwander. And it's in the context of aeroplanes, where Mr. Borowski said the skilled person would want to protect passengers. Now, uh, if you've got that um, in, on paper, put it aside, because we're going to be coming back to it uh, quite shortly when we look at insufficiency. The second complaint um, on remoteness construction relates to drenching, um, and, and and this argument also goes nowhere. They, the appellants say that the judge erred in not considering that their construction helped with safety concerns related to drenching. That is to say, when the socket gets flooded with conductive fluid. Uh, we accept that their construction does help with that. But so does the judge's construction. Both constructions involve keeping the socket free of mains power until a plug is inserted. So they both help with the drenching problem. It's therefore a neutral point on this issue, and there was no error in the judge declining to mention it. It didn't assist in resolving the debate. And the third and final criticism is that the judge didn't distinguish between the location of the passenger and the location of the socket. Uh, I've touched on that already. Uh, as paragraphs 2, 3, and 10 of the patent make clear, the underlying intention is to keep the passenger safe and not the socket. Well, Lords, those are my submissions on construction, and I was going to move on to the related issue of sufficiency, which is, of course, a contingent on a narrow construction of remoteness. Uh, I learned a friend say that if the claim involves keeping the supply device away from the socket, uh, the requirement is conceptually uncertain. The skilled person wouldn't know uh, what to do about it. We say that the concept is entirely clear. You start with the assumption that the socket is in the same area as the passenger, that's the seat area, and then you have to arrange the supply device somewhere out of that area. Of course, that, that negative, out of the passenger area, can be put in practice in a whole host of different ways. That's not a defect of the invention. It is not indicative of any technical uncertainty in its objectives or its teaching. And, and the safety benefit is also clear that both the socket and the cables are quiescent when the socket is not in use. Fundamentally, this type of insufficiency is a question of fact. You can see that from my learned friend's skeleton. So the, this complaint is articulated in paragraphs 65 and 66. 65, towards the end, they say, the skilled person is given no idea whether his or her setup is kept away from the socket, such as it falls within the scope of the claim. It is impossible to know if one is infringing or not. And then paragraph 66, if remoteness is supposed to define the boundary of this mysterious minimum, then the skilled person is unable to tell what is and what is not within its scope. So the proposition is that the test is unworkable. And we have three answers to that complaint. Um, first, the absence of any positive case. Second, the evidence of workability. Uh, and third, um, there is no error of principle. As to the positive case, one would expect this sort of invalidity attack to be advanced in the expert evidence you'd expect Mr. Borowski to have said, in terms, that the skilled person whose knowledge and attributes he discussed at length would be at a loss as to how to judge what was and what's not a suitably remote arrangement. And then we would have had an opportunity 
to ask Professor Wheeler for his views in response. But he never gave that evidence. And there are no evidence references to support the issue in the appeal skeleton. And indeed, my lords, the, the appellant's case is inconsistent with the evidence that Mr. Borowski gave on obviousness that we just looked at. That evidence said, in respect of improvements to Neunschwander, that it would have been obvious to the skilled person to position the socket in the arm of the seat and have the components which control the supply voltage elsewhere, for example, under the seat. What he's saying there is it would have been obvious to the skilled person to add the judge's remoteness to Neunschwander. It must follow that, in his view at least, the skilled person would have understood the technical considerations well. Otherwise, they could not have thought of this feature unprompted. Uh, that is the antithesis of insufficiency. So that's our first point. The second point is the evidence of workability. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. How did the insufficiency of this claim sound in the infringement action that was before the judge? And on this point, we have in mind the discussion of my Lord Lord Justice Burse in the Fibrogen case. Broadly speaking, the rule of thumb, when a defendant has been found to infringe, an allegation of conceptual uncertainty should be met with scepticism. Now, a finding of infringement only occurs when infringement is in dispute. That connotes an element of controversy and argument. In the present case, there were three alleged infringers, Astronics, Saffron, and Panasonic. They had between them two sets of solicitors, but not one of them even disputed infringement of Claim 1. My Lords, that, that gives the lie to the appellant's submissions, that it is impossible to tell whether one is infringing or not. For them, it was impossible to argue that they were non-infringing. That is how conclusive the position was. Our third and final point on the insufficiency is that there's no error of principle. The judge's paragraph 70 is a paradigm, excuse me, my learned friend's paragraph 70, is a paradigm of a complaint without any accompanying error of principle. They say, the judge was wrong to find that his construction did not import a particularly fuzzy boundary. In other words, this is a multifactorial assessment and with which he had reached a different conclusion. Well, that's all I had to say on insufficiency and I was going to move on then to the question of anticipation by Neunschwander, clear and unmistakable directions to work within the claim in issue. Clear and unmistakable directions, that's another multifactorial test in respect of which you should be slow to interfere with the judge's impression of the evidence. As to that evidence, um, it was very different to the material that my learned friend relied on before you yesterday. And that should set alarm bells ringing. His case amounts to an assertion that clear and unmistakable directions are to be found in passages, passages of Neunschwander in respect of which there was no expert evidence whatsoever. Actually, that's not quite right. There was evidence, but it was against his position uh, and he ignored it yesterday. So can we start by looking at the material that was actually before the judge? That starts in uh, Mr. Borowski's first report, which is Supplemental 1, Tab 8. He dealt with the issue of remoteness, which is what we're concerned with here in Neunschwander, uh, in his paragraph 152. And he starts by relying on 
bigger than uh, the, 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 uh, the text in column 6, which was the text that accompanied the figure 2 that you see he's, he's copied out with a little addition of his own. He also relied on figure 5 and column 9, lines 37 to 49. Now that passage is important because it tells you the purpose for which he was referring to figure 5. If you turn up the passage in Neunschwander, it's the passage that's describing the uh, electronic amplifier uh, for use with figure 5, and it refers back to figure 2. So what he's actually doing here is saying, figure two is where I get my remoteness, and figure two is applicable to both the embodiments of Neunschwander. In substance, his evidence on remoteness was limited to the figure two amplifier circuit, and he did not return to this issue in any of his further three reports. Uh, Professor Wheeler, in reply, pointed out the inconsistency in figure two, the dotted lines for the electrical cables without any corresponding dotted lines for the optical cables. And this was an ambiguity in Neunschwander that the judge rightly relied upon. Now, one important point that the judge mentioned but didn't include in his reasoning on this point is picked up in our respondent's notice probably easiest to see it from the judgment, paragraph 119. So remember, the, the issue here is, did Neunschwander give a clear and unmistakable directions for a distant remote arrangement? And um, uh, we referred to that part in column two which said in terms, the features needed for safe and simple operation should not require more space than was available within a receptacle of conventional construction. Now the attraction of such an arrangement is that it can be retrofitted to an existing electrical patras. There's no need to make new holes in your walls. My learned friend's answer yesterday was to say, well, uh, this is all of a piece with the passage on column 9, line 59, uh, but it isn't. Um, there's no reference in that later passage to a receptacle of conventional construction. That's talking about something different. We say the stated feature of the invention in column 2 is clear. All the parts of the product should be found within a conventional, conventional receptacle space. That's what you want to do if you can. That's your ob design objective. So that was the evidence before the judge. And can we consider then the key elements that were relied on for the purposes of this appeal by learned, by learned friend? Uh, the first is at column three, line 52, to column four, line four. And what my learned friend says was that he said that there's a contrast between the reference to emitter and a receptor arranged within the receptacle on the one hand, and the alternatively, the emitter and or receptor may be arranged at a distance on the other. That's the starting point of the argument. He then takes that passage, he uses it to address the inconsistency in figure two, and then imports the whole combination into the figure five arrangement. But there's absolutely no evidence that the skilled person would interpret the document in this way. Mr. Borowski never even referred to this passage in column three. And he never referred to figure five for this purpose. Um, so this is a lawyer's construct. But it's a lawyer's construct after the trial. Um, furthermore, the 
Actually, no, it, it was in part put to the judge. That's not quite fair. It was also put to Professor Wheeler, and he didn't agree with it. This is why my learned friend has no evidence references, references to support his arguments. Can, can we look at that, please? It's in Supplemental Bundle 2, behind tab 21. And turn, please, to page uh, 348 of the transcript pages, which is 469 of the bundle. Now, it's a fairly extensive but entirely unprofitable um, cross-examination. It starts at page 348 in line 25 and moves on through perhaps you could read to yourself down to yourselves down to page 350 uh, line 17 Sorry, page. Down to so. Uh, page 350 of the transcript. Yes. A uh, line 17. Can you just remind me where column nine is? Where it starts. So I'm in column nine on page eight, where it says base yes. plate. So I think that's page nineteen of of the Neunschwander bundle, which has Neunschwander in it. So that's uh, S one su supplemental one tab tab two. I'm sorry, I should, right. have, asked you I should have asked you to yes. have that out. Yes. So wh where we get to is at, at, at line 15 of page 350. Those two components, the light receptor and emitter, may be at a distance. And the witness says, I'm, I'm, I'm not, not sure where you're getting that from. And then my learned friend reads the passage he likes from column three. And then he, picking it up towards the bottom of 351, I agree that the text in the patent says a distance. It doesn't define what a distance is. He says, were you aware of this before? He says, yes, yes, I was. And then page 352, line five, can you explain to me why you didn't see it as relevant? In circumstances where the interpretation of the remote feature of the claim, uh, the one you were given by Jones Day, was to assume remote meant switching mechanism is some distance away. He said, well, my initial readings were, uh, as I said before, I did not read the Lufthansa patent before reading this. Now, pausing there, that, that's important, because what the, what the witness was doing was reading the prior art without knowledge of the patent. And what he's saying is reading it without knowledge of the patent this wasn't something he took away from it. In other words, without hindsight, this wasn't part of the, the learning, the teaching that, that, that landed. Then you, you were asked in your report to consider the disclosure. Okay. And then the answer at 24, correct me if I'm wrong, my lord, I believe I'm looking at this as a point of view of an engineer in 1997. We've taken, and if we're taking the construct that we're discussing at the moment, I'm looking at this in view of an aircraft. Would I wish to have long, delicate fibre optics made of glass going a considerable distance? I would not have made that assumption. In other words, this isn't a teaching that helps you if you're working in an aircraft. And he says, that's nothing to do with the question. He's asked it again. And then at line 16, I believe the phrase is remote, which is not what I see in this teaching. So 
My lord, that was the evidence that the judge heard in relation to this. <laughs> and in respect of which he was asked to make a finding that there were clear and unmistakable directions. Um, we say, given this evidential uncertainty, he was right to give weight to um, the position with Mr. Borowski, which we can see in the judgment of paragraph 145. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Before you go to the next point, just on this point, the argument I thought there were clear and unmistakable directions to supply a device separately, not remotely. And this is saying that it's not obvious or he doesn't, he doesn't see a disclosure of remotely. That doesn't tell you whether it's not clear and unmistakable directions to make it separate. No. Because the, because the case is put against you is that, is that remote means the same as separate. It, 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 it lacks novelty over Neunschwander. So proving that Neunschwander doesn't disclose remotely as you say that should be construed doesn't help. So um, the, the proposition that it disclosed separation was nowhere in the evidence. So I've... No one's... As, no, no, there's no evidence to assist on that point. But of course... The judge didn't, did, didn't, yes, sorry, you're, you're entirely correct. This is clear, clear and unmistakable directions over separation. Yeah. My, my Lord is correct. Obviously, remoteness encompasses separation. Sure. And what, what the witness was saying is, I, I, I'm not getting help out of this part of the document. It didn't, it didn't strike me as something that was material when I read it before I'd seen the pattern. So... It, it may not bear directly on the issue, but it's the best we've got, given the way the evidence um, was before the judge. You may find more assistance on the point from where I'm, I'm going next, which is paragraph 145 of the judgment, where the judge um, uh, records uh, the slightly... The, 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 the evidential provision, position with respect to Mr. Borowski. 145.2, Mr. Borowski had confirmed in cross-examination that in his four reports, he had identified all the parts of Neunschwander which were relevant to the points he wished to make. And of course, th those included addressing Neunschwander and remoteness on the basis of the uh, mere separation uh, uh, construction. And then at 1453, that um, the particular parts of Neunschwander that my learned friend was now seeking to rely on before the judge had not been identified by Mr. Borowski. So neither expert saw this coming out of the passages that my learned friend now urges upon you. So these aren't the findings. This is him, the judge, recording what you said. We uh, can't work. That's true. I don't think it's in dispute that they're not there. Um, I can show you the part in cross-examination where he confirmed that uh, uh, he, he had indeed done that. So I, I, my, my Lord is right, but those, those, uh, those submissions are uh, un unquestionably fairly based. So, my Lord, that, this was the, the evidential context in which the judge whilst acknowledging that my learner friend's submission about the arrangement of emitters and receptors said that there was much room for argument, but the clear and unmistakable directions were not made out. And we say that that was a plainly a conclusion open to him in circumstances where he'd received no expert assistance um, that supported my learner friend's submission. There are um, two other points just to pick up from my learned friend's skeleton on this issue. The first is that the judgment is inconsistent as between Neunschwander and novelty and obviousness. 
That, that wasn't mentioned in my learned friend's oral submissions yesterday. Uh, he, I, I'm grateful he tells me I don't need to, to bother with that. And then the final point is that the judge took no account of the second embodiment of Neunschwander, um, but that's simply not right. He, that's the figure five embodiment, and he refers to it in paragraph 146, three, and in 146, four, He, he, he acknowledges the submission, so he hasn't ignored it. That's, that's, that's the point. Uh, further, of course, that embodiment will also use the, the amplifier circuit of figure two, which he also referred to, in, in particular in his reasoning in 147, uh, and indeed in a paragraph 138. My, my, my Lord, do you want a transcript reference for where Mr. Borowski said, I've looked at all the documents carefully and I've said everything I want to say? Let's have it. So, uh, supplementary bundle three, tab 21, page, so tab 23, page. 55517 to 55795. Well, Lords, I was then going to move on to obviousness. And before embarking on obviousness, it may help take stock of the various moving parts that are in play at this stage. On well, claim one, position regarding insertion is straightforward. If the judge was right about full insertion, it's common ground that claim one is neither disclosed nor obvious. If the appellant's broad construction, partially inserted, is right, it's common ground that is disclosed in Neunschwander. The position on remoteness is rather more nuanced. If the judge's narrow construction kept away is right. The appellants accept that the feature is novel, but they now say he was wrong on obviousness. As to that argument, we say that on a fair reading it is absent from the appeal documents. And we say that's not surprising because the case was never put in evidence and never advanced in closing submissions to the judge. If the appellant's broad construction, mere separation, is right, the appellants say he's wrong about novelty, and I've just dealt with that point, and the judge didn't deal with whether it was obvious, because it wasn't his construction. Claim two, again, we say the appellant's case on claim two was neither advanced at trial, whether in evidence or submission, and the upshot of our complaints about the procedure is that we're going to need to look at look back at what occurred at trial um, with, with a little bit of care. And because of those various complications, I was proposing to start on obviousness with the, the silver bullet, which is the mindset point. Because the judge decided that even if technical obviousness had been made out. The invention was not obvious in light of the mindset of a skilled person. So it's a, it's a quick route to victory if, um, if the mindset appeal is misconceived. Now there's a, an important point, piece of, of context for the mindset issue, which was omitted from my learner friend's submissions, and that's that Low voltage DC and high voltage AC were at all times the only options in play. All domestic equipment is powered from high voltage AC power, albeit most portable electronics actually runs on low voltage DC and needs a transformer to get from one to the other. 
but the choice for an aircraft cabin power supply was at all times a binary one between these two options. Now there was a wealth of evidence before the judge in relation to mindset and I think the, the, the easiest way through it is to see how he dealt with it and that begins in paragraph 217 of the judgment. <coughs> He started with the contemporaneous documents and he worked through them in turn uh, on the basis that we said that they were indicative of uh, the mindset of the skilled person, the thinking of the skilled person at the priority date. The documents covered the perspective of all those interested in in-seat power supply systems. From the manufacturer's perspective, they included several documents that came from the first, defend, the first appellant's uh, predecessor. And all of them asserted the safety of a low voltage DC system. And the judge referred to those in paragraphs 218, 222, 228, 229, and 231. So Astronics, or their predecessors, were all over the contemporaneous documents asserting that DC was safe. And it's implicit in that assertion, when it wasn't expressed, that AC high voltage wasn't safe, because those were the only two options that were ever in play. Then we have the customer's perspective. So just before you leave that, the document 218, is that the one we were showing yesterday? The only one. It's possible. There were uh, there were a lot of them. I'm, I'm not. I, I can't say categorically that that was the, the right one, but it's. Uh, I, I certainly have no quarrel with the judge's summary of what what was said. Uh, if you want to see any of the documents, I, I can show you. I don't think the detail of them is necessary because they all sing from the same hymn sheet. Um, what what is relevant is that they come from they come from different quarters. So. The manufacturer of power supplies, that was, that was uh, um, the first appellant. The customer, we had a, we had a, a correspondence with, with Boeing that the judge referred to, because Boeing voiced their concerns about safety, and, and he refers to that at paragraph 229. Boeing said they would not offer a high voltage AC system and had no basis for making one available based on their interpretation of the regulations. Uh, then we had an engineer's perspective. There was a detailed review from an engineering journal that the judge uh, refers to in paragraph 224. And then we had the regulator's perspective extensive materials from various aviation authorities, the CAA, the FAA, the JAA, which is a transnational governance body, and in particular the, the judge considered a series of safety memoranda. He also had minutes from committee meetings at which representatives of the first appellant advanced concerns about the safety of mains voltage AC systems. And they then pro proposed drafting additional safeguards relating to those systems. And those safeguards were incorporated in formal documents. The first appellant's stated position again and again was that AC power could not be rendered safe for a passenger aircraft cabin. They were engineers working in this field. They were saying it can't be done. Then the judge moved on to the oral evidence in paragraph 234. He records that Mr. Borowski was taken in detail to these documents and it was put to him that the skilled person at the priority date would have thought that high voltage AC power supply in a passenger seat was too dangerous. And 
that it would not gain regulatory approval, and he conceded that the skilled person may have had that opinion. And the judge then explains that he was talking about the aviation specialist. Then in paragraph 235, he considers the relationship between the mindset of the skilled person and the attitude of the regulatory authorities. So at this point, he's moved on from Mr. Borowski's oral evidence. And his thinking on the point is clearly expressed towards the end of the paragraph. I consider that the attitude of the FAA and the JAA does tell one a great deal about the state of the common general knowledge of and the mindset and prejudices of the skilled person without any inventive capacity. And then in 236, he draws all this material together in a compelling conclusion, a series of four conclusions, that the mindset of the skilled persons, the aviation specialists, were that a high voltage AC system was significantly more dangerous than a low voltage DC system. Pausing there, that's recognizing the binary nature of, of the options available. One is much more dangerous than the other. It's a choice between the two. That the aviation authorities would resist a proposal to install such a system. That the reasons for that resistance were well understood by the skilled person. And the conclusion is that the design of an ISPSS, an in-seat power supply, would have to be a low voltage DC system. So we can move on to the criticisms of that judgment. My learner friends have, have three points, or they did in their written skeleton. The main point in the written skeleton was that the judge only made a mindset finding in relation to a subset of skilled persons. Uh, that, that wasn't mentioned in oral submissions. I wonder if I could ask my learner friend if it's still pursued, because I don't want to bother you if it's not. It's not. I'm grateful. Um, so the, the main point that was actually run yesterday was that the judge wrongly omitted the attractions of AC power from the mindset of the skilled person. Um, well, we say that involves a, a fundamental misunderstanding of the mindset that was actually in issue. This, this was not a case like the, the Dyson case, where people knew about the existence of AC power, but presumed it wasn't useful only for the patent to revive their interest. Everyone appreciated that an AC mains voltage solution would have been attractive. Obviously, it would be attractive. It re replicates what you have in your wall at home. It's enormously convenient. The problem wasn't that it wasn't attractive. They didn't know how to do it. The whole trial took place in a context where it was a given that mains AC would be preferable if it could be made safe. That, of course, is why we got a patent, and that is why the appellants infringed it. And mains AC was all over the mindset documents. It was only, it was only there because, of course, the existing system, low voltage DC, was not optimal. It wasn't as convenient. That's why the discussions were taking place. But to suggest that the judge didn't have that in mind is, is with respect, uh, unarguable. Um, I mean, look at paragraph 218 of the judgment. We've got it already. The submission from, from the first appellant's predecessor that DC, low voltage DC, was very safe compared with AC. You can't forget that that's what's an issue. The reason he even has to say that is because all other things being equal, people want AC. Of course they do. Um, what, what they were saying there is that their selling point is safety over convenience. And para, paragraph 225 of the judgment, the, the JAA draft policy, that was amended to provide a strong recommendation for low DC voltages. 
I mean, that, that is in a context where none of the passengers will actually use a low DC voltage at home. The JAA was stating that standard voltages were not appropriate due to passenger safety risks. If everyone wanted low voltage DC or were happy with it, this sort of statement was a waste of time. What it's really saying is that what customers want is bad for them, so you can't provide it. And Boeing, paragraph 229, Boeing said it wouldn't offer a high voltage AC system. What, what doesn't need to be said is that customers would like it. But unsurprisingly, in an aircraft environment, commercial concerns give way to safety. So it, it is, we submit, implicit in all this material that AC is commercially desirable. The problem was that skilled persons couldn't think of a way to make it safe and therefore the regulators would not approve it. So there was no missing piece of the mindset jigsaw. It was all there. For these reasons, we, we, we don't accept that the judge didn't take account of the attractiveness of AC. He couldn't have ignored it if he wanted to. The reason it's not addressed in the judgment is it doesn't really come into the equation. On the one hand, people want it. On the other hand, it's not safe for an aircraft cabin. So it doesn't matter that people want it. We're not going to give them something that isn't safe. We regulate the aircraft environment to make it safe. You can't have it. No one in this business is going to install in an aircraft cabin equipment that isn't safe. The other point that my learned friend took yesterday was that he said the judge had failed to apply the structured approach set out in Pozzoli, and what this came down to was the assertion that it was wrong to take regulatory approval into account because the patent didn't teach the skilled addressee anything about a system capable of gaining regulatory approval. Uh, we, we struggle to see how the first appellant can authorise that submission. The patented system had the effect of changing the whole regulatory landscape. Um, and you can see that from the judgment, so it's implicit in any way, in the judgment at paragraph 238. Mr. Ackland asked, if the, AC, if the use of high voltage AC was out of the question, why did the JAA spend time providing for extra safeguards for such a system? And why did Mr. Brisky of the first appellant why was he sent out to try to persuade the FAA and others not to certify such a system? The answer is that those things didn't happen before the priority date. Everything changed post-patent because we were then in a world where someone had come up with a safe solution to this problem. So the idea that the patent doesn't help you with regulation. Uh, I, I, we, we struggle to understand. I mean, it, it may be that my learner friend was aiming this submission in particular at claim one because um, the system that was initially uh, um, passed by the regulators had the timing feature of claim two. So perhaps he's saying the mindset doesn't work in relation to claim one um, because you haven't shown that that gets you past the regulators. But he's wrong about that as well, because um, we know that uh, Astronix modified the system to drop the timing feature. And the judge recorded that the modified system uh, did not infringe claim two. So we have a system which infringes only claim one, and yet it is pleaded by the appellants as having obtain certification from the regulatory authorities. Uh, that's the core bundle, tab 15, page 165. So if you like, we've got a control experiment there, a system which only has claim one, but not the feature of claim two, has obtained certification. It has uh, overcome the mindset uh, that the judge felt uh, held to be in place.
my laws, that's all I had to say on, on, on the mindset. And then I think the next point, point six, is the obviousness of remoteness on the judge's construction. So distant remoteness, and we're only concerned with the Neutschwander prior art. Um, one important point to consider, now we've moved off construction, is that um, remoteness is liable to mislead because um, now we're talking about obviousness, it needs to incorporate these, these switching um, uh, features as well. So if you turn to the judgment of paragraph 246, the judge uh, uh, accurately summarised what had to be found over and above the prior art that was before him, both Salati and Neunschwander. It wasn't just mere separation of supply device and uh, a socket. You had to have an intelligent switch in the supply device that was triggered by an event at the socket. That, that's what we're talking about when, we, uh, when we're looking at the obviousness arguments now. Now, if we could start then in the judgment, and we need to start with the with the uh, Salati uh, uh, part of the judgment, because as we will come on to see, uh, the appellants advanced the same case before the trial judge in respect of Neunschwander, uh, and that is actually the source of uh, much of their difficulties today. So at 2.50, um, he, he records that Salati did not provide or remote separation of the switch, uh, and that's a callback to his paragraph 182, which is the conclusion that Salati did not contain any clear and unmistakable directions in that respect. Um, we don't need to bother with 251, which is about drenching uh, and doesn't actually advance uh, these arguments. Then paragraph 252 was the ARIC specification. Um, that is now that now looms large in my learned friend's uh, uh, submissions. Um, just to give you the context, it was never referred to by Mr. Borowski. It was introduced into the case as a cross-examination document. Uh, it was put to Professor Wheeler, but only in relation to Salati, never in relation to Neunschwander, uh, and he didn't accept what was put to him in any event. So the judge deals with Arink at 252, and he says um, that didn't show, it did show separation, but it didn't have the switching arrangement. He said the same about M power, which is no longer relied on for the purpose of this appeal. And then he drew his conclusion in 254. Neither Arink nor the M power system made it obvious to introduce this remote switching. So um, that is the proposition that the appellants need to overcome on, an, on this appeal. And our first basis for resisting their appeal is, is a straightforward one. We've now been told, even though we had to serve an RFI to extract the information, that paragraphs 84 to 95 of the appeal skeleton is intended to advance an argument that the judge ought to have concluded the judge's remoteness, switching remoteness, was obvious over Neunschwander. We don't accept that proposition. Uh, we've explain, explained our position in paragraph 26 and of our supplementary skeleton, um, properly read together with the grounds of appeal. There was no, and there is no, written argument to that end. The argument is exclusively put forward on the basis, the contingent basis, of um, my learned friend's remoteness construction, mere separation. Now, I'm not going to take up any more time uh, with that today. My laws will come to their own views, having read the, uh, uh, the written submissions. Instead, I will deal with the new case. And, and I, I mean new case because there was a fundamental change in the appeal in this point in my learned friend's submissions yesterday. You take the appeal skeleton, even if you were to assume 
that it runs the right argument in relation to the right uh, construction. So if you turn to page 18, the challenge that faced the appellants was where do we find a switching arrangement in the common general knowledge? Because that's what we need to, to add to Neunschwander to get within the claim. And in their skeleton, their answer was a document called DJB8. We can see the way it is introduced in paragraph 90. Well, it comes in two parts. Firstly, in paragraph 90. Paragraph 90 talks about the M power system. And it says at the end, the submission is, the M power, power supply had to be remote in the judge's understanding. So what they were saying is the M power system had this remote switching. And they want to then say, well, you'd combine your knowledge of that with Neunschwander and hey presto, you're within the claim. There was a difficulty with that because the judge dealt with that document and said, there was re-examination, we went back and forth, and he said he was unable to accept the evidence that had been given in re-examination. So they know they've got difficulty with that, and indeed they've abandoned it. Then they move on to another document. Now this was helpful for them in that it expressly disclosed switching. This is, at 206, the judge addressed another document, an article by OAC. You can take it from me, that's exhibit DJB8. And this gets them switching. So now they're out of the hole that they were in before. They can combine M power switching with Neunschwander, and everything's obvious. But in alighting upon this, argue, this document, they, they actually fell into a different hole, one we explained in our supplemental skeleton, which is that it was never established to be CGK. On the contrary, their own experts said that the technical information about the MPOW system would have come from other documents, which didn't disclose, which the judge held didn't disclose switching. So paragraph 91 is no good either, and they've had to abandon that. My learned friend has, com has confirmed to me that that case is no longer run. So instead, yesterday, we've got another rabbit out of the hat, which is, oh, well, what we'll do now is we will boost our reliance on Neunschwander. We'll say you get the switching from that and then the, rem the separation from Arink. That was the case that was put yesterday. And that's not a case that they can run in light of the evidence at trial. So let me start to make good that proposition with Mr. Borowski's evidence on obviousness over Neunschwander. We've looked at it already. It is Supplemental Bundle 1, Tab 8, page 164, paragraph 177. And Mr. Borowski's primary position was that remoteness was disclosed. And if he's wrong about that, he says it would have been obvious to position the socket in the arm and have the supply device under the seat. He doesn't say where the skilled person would get that idea from. He simply says the motivation would be providing a safer system. He refers to the MPOW system, but that's no longer relied on. There's no mention of ARIC and no mention of any remote switching arrangement in Neunschwander. In other words, he doesn't say that the skilled person would extract from Neunschwander the disclosure that my learned friend a lot relies on for this appeal. Instead, the switching feature in his reply report, because Professor Wheeler says this is missing, in his reply report, he relied on something called a thrust reverser. If you turn forward to the next tab, tab six, tab, tab nine, page one eight one, paragraph thirty six.
Professor Wheeler suggests that the idea of switching off and on automatically by reference to a satisfaction of some external condition was not known. I do not agree. Sensors in an engine monitor monitor the position of the thrust reverser sleeve, etc. That didn't survive the evidence, that proposition. And it's not relied on here. So the whole case that was opened before you yesterday on obviousness was a stranger to Mr. Gorowski's evidence. What of Mr. Uh, Professor Wheeler? Well, um, Professor Wheeler had considered whether the skilled person might combine Neunschwander with a remote arrangement such as was found in the M-Power system. And he gave his evidence in relation to that proposition. This is bundle S1, tab 7, page 127. My lords could read paragraph, sorry, page 128. Perhaps my lords could read paragraph 57 to themselves. Neunschwander's specific aims, that its features should fit within a conventional socket. He said the optical solution was unsuitable for an aircraft, and he considered that if the skilled person were making safety improvements to Neunschwander for an aircraft deployment, they would try to guard against the drenching problem by using commonly known techniques such as mounting the socket vertically or using a hinged cover. He never mentioned Arink, either here or in his reply report, because of course uh, Mr. Borowski had never mentioned it. So as the trial began, there was, n there was no... Oh, interesting. So that was his reply report. I'm sorry, so he didn't mention it, yes, because uh, Mr. Borowski hadn't. Um, when the trial started, there was no positive evidence regarding a combination of Neunschwander and Arik, and there was evidence from Professor Wheeler that Neunschwander was specifically unsuitable for an aircraft and taught away from the patent's remoteness. Now, it, it is, of course, legitimate as a matter of law to combine common general knowledge with the teaching of a prior art citation. But that combination still needs a, a factual basis. Um, we don't have the, the, the excerpt in the trial bundles, it's a, but it's a, a, a well-trammeled proposition. Perhaps I could just read the, the couple of sentences from Terrell which make the position clear. I don't think it's in any way controversial. Uh, this is paragraph 1246 and the uh, subject is combining cited art with common general knowledge. A definition of common general knowledge is potentially a very wide one, but of course it doesn't follow that merely because some piece of information falls within that definition, it is necessarily obvious to combine it with a cited piece of prior art whether such a combination would be made is a question of fact in each case. Entirely unsurprising. So the question is, what was the evidence before the court that the combination that my learned friend urges upon you was obvious? And the answer is, there wasn't any. It was never put. It was never led by Mr. Borowski. It was never put to, Mr. to Professor Wheeler. Now, Arink was put to Professor Wheeler, but only in the context of Salati. And that is because the case theory pursued by the appellants at trial involved drawing no distinction 
between Silati and Neunschwander. In a moment, I'll show you how it was presented in the written closings. As a result, though, they didn't consider that they needed to put their case on obviousness separately in respect of the two prior art citations. Now, they were always already on notice that that was not an appropriate approach, or that at least it was a very risky one, because Professor Wheeler had given specific evidence in relation to Neunschwander. That's the paragraph 57 I've just showed you. That evidence was never challenged. And yet, my learned friend is inviting you to ignore it. He wants you to come to a conclusion that the skilled person would have made this combination, take Neunschwander, add something from Arik, that's all obvious, without ever having put it to my expert that there was a problem with his views as to the skilled person's response to Neunschwander on this point. And that's why we say this simply isn't open to him. But the position is even worse because the propositions regarding Arik that were put in respect of Salati weren't accepted. It's not just that they didn't put them, put them in relation to Neunschwander, when they did put them, they weren't accepted. Uh, and the proposition was put on, on, on the premise, the express premise, that separation was disclosed in Silati, and he didn't accept that either. I don't think we need to go to the, the, uh, the transcript references, but I will to the transcript, but I will give you the reference, which is S2, tab 21, page 465. Pages 333, line 12, to 334, line 2. And it was in that context that the judge recorded in paragraph 208 that he didn't need to decide the dispute on whether Arink was common general knowledge. Instead, he decided some rather trite propositions would be known, placing an electronics box under the seat for reasons of cabin design and convenience and to avoid contact with liquids. So those are the propositions that are available to, build, to, to my learned friend in building a case on this appeal. But he then needs to show you evidence to the effect that the skilled person would take them uh, the skilled person with, with Neunschwander to hand would take those propositions and combine them and end up in the claim. And he has no evidence whatsoever. And as I've said, he faces a formidable hurdle in the form of Professor Wheeler's unchallenged evidence that Neunschwander points away from that approach. That was the evidence, and then we come to the position in closing. The appellant's written closing is in Supplemental Bundle 2, behind tab 18. Neunschwander and obviousness is addressed in paragraph 288, a single paragraph, 288, on page 354 of the bundle. All they did is said, well, we're running the same argument as we did on Selassie. They didn't add to that in their oral submissions. And yet, and yet before this court, they criticised the judge for not distinguishing between them. So let's see what they said in relation to Selassie. For that, you go back to 253. 253, if the remote feature is not disclosed, it's nonetheless obvious. The Arink case is put in paragraph 256. And the conclusion in 259 is that 
remoteness is obvious on the appropriate understanding of such remoteness. Well, the appropriate understanding, as per this document, is in paragraph 221, physically separate. So what you might ask was the appellant's position at trial in closing in the event that they were wrong about that construction of remoteness. What was their fallback case? And the answer is there wasn't one. And yet that's the case they want to run on this appeal. A case they never invited the judge <coughs> even to consider. I've mentioned already the problem with the appellant's case theory, which, what, which uh, did not distinguish between Neunschwander and Salati, and we've just seen how that uh, came to fruition in the closing submissions. And I, I've mentioned that this is a criticism that's m made of the judgment, but it may help if I can explain how this mess was of the appellant's own making. In the written evidence, Salati was probably the stronger option for the appellants. Uh, that was because Professor Wheeler had his specific points against Neunschwander uh, that I've taken you to. And because neither expert had read Neunschwander in the manner in which the appellants now do. So in this two-horse race, it looked as if Salati was a, a clear favourite. And that may be why Salati was favoured in the cross-examination of Professor Wheeler, and points were only run in relation to it. Um, whatever the reason, that's what was done. And the proposition that any combination of Neunschwander with Arink, or any related propositions, um, uh, that, that, that that was obvious, was never put to Professor Wheeler. And the appellant's closing was consistent with that. It's very much a Salati first document. But in his judgment, the judge decided that there was definitely no disclosure of remoteness in Salati. But on the other hand, the position was somewhat more equivocal regarding Neunschwander. And that's why Neunschwander looked as if it provided a better candidate on appeal. But it also meant that the appellants had backed the wrong horse in evidence and indeed in their closing submissions before the judge. Uh, and it's now too late to change before this court. The propositions that they needed to establish in evidence have never been put, let alone accepted. And the contrary propositions were never challenged. And then they themselves declined to distinguish the position in their closing submissions to the judge. So for those reasons, my lords, we invite you to reject the obviousness appeal uh, in respect of claim one, and we can move on to claim two. So claim two is the timing feature, and there's only one point of substance here, which is the complaint that the judge's decision was inconsistent. That is to say that he decided in the context of novelty that Neunschwander hinted at a timing feature and then subsequently ignored that hint when it came to obviousness. Um, we have two points in response. First, this wasn't their case at trial. And second, that the judge didn't find, didn't, didn't in fact find any such hint. Picking up the first point, we've looked at Mr. Borowski's evidence. He never said, well, if it's not disclosed in Neunschwander, I think the skilled person would get a flavor of the idea of timing from the uh, disclosure, and that would inspire them to, um, uh, to, to design a timing feature. Um, uh, 
my learned, my learned junior reminds me that actually I haven't shown you that bit of evidence, and of course he's right. Uh, I showed you um, his evidence on claim one, so just to make good that point, it evidence on claim two is supplementary bundle one, tab nine, sorry, tab eight, uh, page 164. Paragraphs 178 to 181. He says, I think it's disclosed. If I'm wrong about this, it would have been obvious to add to the timing century circuitry and trivial to implement it. And then his evidence on obviousness was based on the attractiveness of the feature. Nothing to do with any um, hint or suggestion of the timing that would otherwise be obtained from the document. Now, um, the appellants lost on that argument, and there's no appeal in relation to it. And, and, and they didn't run a fallback position in their submissions, that even if not disclosed, the skilled person would find a hint towards a timing feature in the language of Neunschwander. Um, we can see that in Supplemental Bundle 2, tab 18. Paragraph 297 to 300. They don't say if we're wrong about disclosure, there's nonetheless uh, a suggestion in the language that would point the skilled person in this direction. And the judge, therefore, didn't address such a case. Um, and for what it's worth, given that the case is being run for the first time in this court, we should refer you to the contrary evidence of Professor Wheeler. Supplemental Bundle 1, Tab 6. Paragraphs 245 to 247. He gave some uh, detailed evidence in respect to the timing feature and Neuenschwander specific. His conclusion was that Neunschwander teaches away from the introduction of any timing feature. If this feature were to occur to the skilled person as an improvement to Neunschwander, it would have to do so in opposition to these aspects of its teaching. I consider that this provides an additional reason why such an improvement would not come to the mind of the skilled person. And I don't imagine it will surprise you to hear that that evidence was not challenged. What, what's happened here is that this uh, is pure opportunism, this element of the appeal, uh, arising out of the judgment. They've seen the way in which the judge resolved the uh, novelty clear and unmistakable directions point, they've seen that he says, he uses the word hint, and they say, aha, well, we'll take that and we'll have that for our obviousness case on appeal, even though they never ran it below, and that there was evidence uh, contrary to it that they never challenged. So that's my first point. My second point is that we say, in any event, the judgment has been misread by the appellants. Um, if you could turn in the judgment to paragraph 159.
the judge starts by recording that uh, Mr. Borowski accepted that there was no express timing, no express disclosure of a timing feature in Neunschwander. And then in 160, he said, I can see how it might be said that the statement in column three could signify that there would be some feature of the invention which would not allow the supply voltage unless the pins of the plug moved simultaneously. However, given the normal configuration of the, of the pins of a plug, the pins of a plug will move substantially simultaneously when inserted into a socket. It's entirely possible that what Neunschwander was attempting to describe in the relevant text was what would happen in the ordinary case with an ordinary plug, rather than attempting to refer to a feature of which there was no other hint. And then he goes on in 161 to say there are no clear and unmistakable directions. And in 162, he says in the penultimate sentence, if, as I have held, the relevant text in Neunschwander did not refer to a timing feature. So standing back, what you have is over those taking those paragraphs together, he said that the judge is not resolving the question of whether there is a hint or not. What he actually says is both conclusions were available. He doesn't need to resolve it because whichever way it goes, he's, he, he says it's not clear and unmistakable directions. There is no conclusion that the document did hint at anything. The reference to no other hint is, is applicable to the indeterminate. There's, there's zero or one hint, and then no other hint. It, it, it doesn't determine that the first reference was or was not a hint. And we say it cannot be an error of principle for him not to rely on a finding which he did not conclusively make. My Lords, there are two secondary points run by the appellants on the distinctions between Salati and Neunschwander, uh, which they say the judge overlooked. Um, for the reasons I've already explained, these, these are problems of their own making. Um, they declined to draw his attention to any material distinctions in closing, and they can't complain about it now. But in any event, um, we reject them. The first point relates to the double knitting needle problem. This is paragraphs 124 and 126 of their uh, appeal skeleton. They say he didn't take account of the double knitting needle problem um, in respect to which Neunschwander provided a solution and Salati didn't. Um, but their case in closing was that Salati had precisely the same uh, approach I'm sorry, I've got that slightly wrong. Um, the, the point in the skeleton is that there is a particular vulnerability in Neunschwander that would have prompted a particular response in the skilled person. And yet their closing submissions on Salati were that it had precisely the same vulnerability to the du double knitting needle problem. So for your reference, that's their written closings paragraphs 297 to 298 for Neunschwander and 263 for Salati. Uh, the, the, the final point they make is that they say, well, Neunschwander taught an electrical solution whilst Salati did not. And they say the judge should have taken account of that. Um, that submission has no evidential support, uh, and it's technically wrong. Um, the, the correct analysis is that Salati taught the use of a mechanical electrical transducer, which is what a switch, as a matter of physics, is. And Neunschwander taught the use of an optical electrical transducer. That's what an optical switch is. But um, there's no difference on the electrical side. The 
differences on the other side, the type of energy that's being used to close an electrical switch. Is it kinetic energy or is it optical energy? Um, so there is no material difference and the submission is, uh, is misconceived. My Lords, I wonder if that's a convenient moment. Uh, I only have left the respondent's notice point on uh, the Astronics safety submissions, but it might take 10 minutes. Very well. So we'll start again at uh, 2 o'clock.